CPI Mindtree, the stock slides after two global sales executives depart. The exits follow the spate of others since October last year, adding to already heightened concerns on this count. After announcing a partnership for a digital first asset management venture in July last year, Geo and BlackRock have agreed to form another 50-50 venture for wealth management in India with further plans to set up a brokerage for stock rallies. Indian Met Department tells CNBC TV18 that the monsoon this year is not only likely to be above average but also well distributed, fueling hopes of a rural demand revival. Hello and welcome. Good afternoon. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. I'm Mangla Malu. With me as always, Ekta Batra. Uh, the Nifty has uh, recovered from the lows, those facing some sort of supply around levels of 22,200. Importantly, the broader markets this morning are looking, uh, this afternoon rather, looking a lot better with nearly three stocks advancing for every one stock which is declining. So, one and a half days of weakness for our market. Uh, yesterday, there was a decline, then there was a recovery and a subsequent decline. Today, there was recovery and selling into the recovery. Uh, the question is now whether in the second half of trade there would be some pullback. Yes, absolutely, Manglam. Like you mentioned, you know, what probably stands out is that the broader markets are seeing some amount of an outperformance, but that too has been sold into. So, just a couple of minutes ago, the mid-cap index was up around half a percent. That's petered off to around a three-tenths three of a percent gain. The advanced decline ratio, that's the other key monitorable to watch out for. So, over 2,300 stocks advancing to around 1,300 stocks declining on the Bombay Stock Exchange. So, that's definitely positive. Let's see whether that sustains. We do have a lot of cues coming up. So, for example, we have the Fed Chair, uh, Jerome Powell, who will be speaking at the Washington Forum on, on the Canadian economy. Uh, that takes place today. So, that'll be an important cue to watch out for. Remember, we'll be reacting to it on Thursday, considering tomorrow markets are closed. But... Um, in terms of earnings as well back home, we have a couple of uh, couple of them to watch out for. So, Angel One, Just Dial, Tata Communication tomorrow. And then the big ones such as Bajaj Auto, HDFC Life, ICICI Securities, Infosys obviously and Mass Tech. All of them will come out on the 18th of April, which is Thursday. So, a lot to focus on in terms of queues. A lot to focus on in terms of queues. But there are a lot of uh, stocks which are on our radar as well. A bunch of them doing well. In fact, uh, Let's pull up the intraday chart of HDFC Bank. It's a fair rate on the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank, along with the Nifty Financial Services. Both of them going for expiry in the second half of trade. So that stock has moved to the high point of trade. And the other one, which is a recent mover on the way up, is Tata Consumer. So let's put up uh, the intraday chart of Tata Consumer that comes up on your screen. The FMCG stocks doing relatively better today on hopes of uh, well-distributed monsoons. But one stock which has been surging not just today, but all of this month and this year is an unusual mover and that's the special offering that we have today for you. Coffee Day, which is up nearly 10%. Uh, that's the 10% move that we're seeing today. But if you just take a look at it, you know, the unusual mover that the stock is. This month itself, it's up 45% and this year, it's up 120%. And because of its uh, vast moves, the stock has been put by the exchanges in the additional surveillance uh, measurement, ASM Stage 1. So that's something we need to keep on our radar. For those who are questioning what exactly is happening with the company and why is it that the stock is up 45% this month, the exchanges made the same question to the company and the company said to the exchanges last week that movement in the price of shares is purely due to market conditions and is absolutely market driven. The management of the company is in no way connected with any such movement of the price of the share. Additionally, as the start of this uh, financial year uh, began, you know, there was another disclosure on the exchanges telling you that there is 434 crore rupees worth loan slash interest payments that the company has defaulted upon. The company to that has said that the this delay in debt servicing has been due to liquidity crisis. And as of December 31st, the group has borrowings of close to 1337 crore. So one is wondering then for a company that is laden with debt, uh, debt and has, uh, you know, liquidity crisis, what is it that is causing the stock price to move higher? I looked at the fundamentals. First nine months of this year, revenues are up 14%. The EBITDA is up 60%. And they've reduced their debt from a year ago as well. And that's reflected in their finance costs, which have come down from 58 crores 
to 37 crores itself. How did they go ahead and do that? One, they are selling some of their assets. They sold corporate office building for which they got an additional profit of close to around 56 crores. And the other steps that they've taken to, you know, improve their operational performance or reduce expenses is when they are reducing the number of stores. So same time last year, the number of stores that they had were 480. Now that's come down to around 454. That's coffee day stores. And what they're doing is they're increasing the business that is doing better for them, which is the vending machines that are there in offices. So at the same time last year, they had vending machines of close to 46,800, uh, uh, you know, uh, units. That has increased to around 52,600 units, aiding their margins, profitability and return ratios as well. Now, with this kind of up move that has happened and with all things that are happening in the company, let's look at the key things to track going forward. One is the steps that the company will take to improve their liquidity and reduce debt because the enterprise value of the company is close to around 2,500 crores. Any improvement in in-store metrics and growth is something that we'll be tracking. And finally, the impact of competition coming in from now mature and established brands in the country like Starbucks, Third Wave and some other coffee chains which have recently uh, you know, raised funds from a round of private and H&I investors. So those are a bunch of things that we'll be watching in on Coffee Day Enterprises. Enterprise value of around 2,500 crores with, uh, you know, problems on its balance sheet, but showing signs of improvement on operational basis. Okay, all right. So that stock is up around 9 odd percent, a complete uh, 360 analysis there on Coffee Day. But now let's cut across to our colleague Parikshit Lutra, who's in conversation with Deepak Thakur, who's the MD and CEO of Mahindra Sustain, to discuss all about the group's 1,200 crore investment in a renewable energy project. Yes, uh, Mahindra Group is investing 1,200 crores in a 150 megawatt hybrid renewable energy project. This is a mix of wind and solar and largely this is going to be for captive capacity of the Mahindra Group, uh, helping the company adopt 100% renewable energy by 2030. Let me go across with Deepak Thakur, MD and CEO of uh, Mahindra Sustain. So Mahindra Sustain, Deepak, will be developing this project. Give us a sense of uh, where is the funding coming from? Is it entirely from the Mahindra Group? And what actually is the 2030 target across Mahindra Group businesses? So let me take the first. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the, on the program. Um, as far as the Mahindra Group is concerned, uh, we have made a commitment uh, with respect to sustainability goals and within that, uh, the RE transition uh, commitment that we have made is that we would like to move to 100% power by 2030. Um, with regard to this particular project, this project that we are setting up in Maharashtra as a group captive project uh, actually is uh, part of the bigger plan that the Mahindra Sustain Group has actually committed to. So we have actually committed to building about five and a half thousand megawatts of projects in the next five years. Uh, and for this, the shareholders, that is the Bindra Group and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which has a 39.9% stake within the group, uh, within Sustain, mm. have actually committed equity mm. uh, for this particular build-up. Mm. This 150 is, as I mentioned, is part of this entire uh, five and a half thousand megawatt plan that we have approved uh, at our end. Right. Uh, would Mahindra Group like to expand such hybrid capacity to provide renewable energy to other manufacturers, other companies? Is there a plan on the cards? Uh, so, yes, I think even this uh, group captive project that we have set up, currently I think uh, would about close to about 55-56% of the total capacity is uh, committed by auto and farm sector and other group companies which are based in Maharashtra, which will actually utilize this power. And the balance, 35-40% of the power actually is something that we would look at uh, contracting with third-party entities. Right. Uh, tell us about your key growth drivers for your portfolio in uh, FY25. So, um, if you'll, I'll just take a step back. So, if you look at uh, sustained growth, we have already done about 1,500 megawatt, 1,540 megawatts of projects, solar projects that we have built as a developer uh, in the last six years. And now we have, a, as I mentioned, a plan to build up about five and a half thousand megawatts, which is almost three and a half times of that capacity in the next uh, five years. Of this capacity, we already have about 2,000 megawatts, including this 150 megawatt project that we just spoke of, uh, of capacity which has already been won or acquired by, by Mindra Sustain. And we are in the process of now constructing and building this capacity. All right, so that's some interesting conversation with Mahindra Sestain. What we'll do is we'll take a short break, and as we do that, we'll uh, share an announcement that we have for you all. We're launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance uh, webinar, CNBC TV 18 
accelerate. But before that, let's uh, cut across to the press conference where Kumar Mangalam Birla is addressing the press. This is the Aditya Birla Capital event. Uh, the reason why Kumar Mangalam Birla speaking at this event is extremely important is because of the various, uh, you know, things that the group is undertaking right now. This one's with regards to Aditya Birla Capital. We'll try and hear if uh, he has some questions to answer with regards to Vodafone as well. This has no other parallel in the world. We have demonstrated at extraordinary scale the power of digital as a force for good, both for business and for society. Transactions on UPI have grown at a staggering rate of 140% Kega from 1 lakh crores in FI18 to almost 200 lakh crores in FI24. And since its launch in Jan last year, ONDC has facilitated almost 50 million transactions whilst growing its network to that of 3.8 lakh sellers. India today, without doubt, therefore, is the global leader in developing digital public infrastructure. And as an example, Philippines has embraced our Aadhaar-like technology, and 76 million of its 110 million people now have a digital identity like all of us here in India. As India takes center stage to shape the future of the global economy, the Aditya Birla Group, all of us, find ourselves in a very unique situation to contribute to this very transformative journey. As we navigate through the dynamic landscape of India's economic resurgence, our diversified businesses stand as pillars of growth. From metals to cement, fashion to financial services, textiles to trading and real estate, to renewables, our businesses have played their part in driving progress and shaping in their own way the future of the nation. The ABG network serves over 250 million customers across 14 sectors, commanding a leadership position across key industries, including cement, metals, fiber, financial services, fashion retail, and chemicals. As we advance into 2024, the launch of two new consumer-facing ventures marks the group's commitment to constructing a growth platform characterized by a unique, unique confluence of strength and breadth. Just last month, we launched our paints business with an initial investment of rupees 10,000 crores, as you know, and in a few months, we will be launching a jewelry retail venture with an initial investment of rupees 5,000 crores. I'm proud to share that Aditya Birla Capital is one of the fastest growing companies within the Aditya Birla Group today. This in both, both in terms of accelerated growth trajectory and profitability. And today as we stand at a pivotal juncture where our ambition, imagination and performance now dictate a bold transformative future, this is as much true for India as it is for us as a group. The financial services sector in particular will play a very crucial role in driving today's multi-decadal growth vision forward. From banking to insurance, from fintech to wealth management, we have witnessed unprecedented growth and dynamism across the sector. At the head, heart of this transformation lies data, digital and technology, which is advancing, as all of you know, at lightning velocity, unleashing breakthroughs across the industry. Over the years, our financial services business, Aditya Birla Capital, has emerged as a key growth engine for our group, and I see this as a coming-of-age moment for Aditya Birla Capital. So let's put, put our hands together for all of you. Congratulations. Aditya Birla Capital has now emerged, as all of you know, as a leading financial services conglomerate with over 4 lakh crores in assets under management, and we are perhaps the only few fran franchises other than banks who have all the products that a customer needs under one umbrella, that too as a manufacturer. The numbers speak for themselves. Consolidated revenue grew by 22% year-on-year during the first nine months 
of FY24. If profit after tax has grown by 44% during the same period. Each business in Aditya Birla Capital has demonstrated strong performance over the years. Our NBFC business has grown from an AUM, AUM of 50,000 crores to an AUM of 100,000 crores in just the last two years, which makes us the fourth largest diversified which makes us the fourth largest diversified NBFC in the country. Profitability has also grown by two times in two years. Going forward, the recently proposed merger of our NBFC business into Aditya Birla Capital, which is already listed, will further create a unified large entity with greater financial strength and flexibility, enabling direct access to capital. Moving on to our finance, housing finance business, we have witnessed accelerated growth with 27% year-on-year growth and profit in the same period has grown by 25%. Our health insurance business is one of the fastest growing standalone health insurance players in the industry driven by a unique health first model. It has also raised capital in FY23 from a marquee sovereign wealth fund, Adia. And this transaction valued the health insurance business at $800 million. In the life insurance space, we are one of the leading players with a total pre premium of 11,000 crores in the first nine months of this financial year. Our AMC business continues to be the largest non-bank asset manager in India. It crossed the milestone of 3.11 lakh crores AUM as of December 2023. That deserves a big applause, I think. The growth across our businesses has been aided by the expansion in the branch network Aditya Birla Capital has added over 500 branches in the last two years, taking up Pan-India physical presence to about 1,500 branches while serving 35 million customers. The markets have also responded favorably, as you know, to our concerted initiatives. And in the last two years, Aditya Birla Capital's market cap has grown by 111%, crossing the 50,000 crore mark. And this... And this, we should add quickly, is just the beginning. This underscores investor and market confidence in the collective potential of Aditya Birla Capital. Looking forward as digital financial services continue to underpin the fabric of the financial services sector, we envision leading the charge in reshaping the future of financing through a consumer-first and digital-first approach. This has culminated into the development of our all-inclusive customer-facing platforms. These platforms are interoperable and will be leveraged to drive synergy across the group ecosystem. Last year, we rolled out our unified and differentiated digital lending platform called Udyog Plus to help the MSME segment to avail seamless lending and value-added services and tap into the vast potential of an inclusive e-commerce system. This platform is integrated with the ABG ecosystem and is emerging as a one-stop financial solution for the MSME category. To further strengthen our customer proposition, today we are happy to announce the launch of yet another platform, this time an omni-channel D2C platform to acquire new customers in a seamless manner. The genesis of Aditya Birla Capital Digital or ABCD, lies in our endeavor to adapt and address the shifting consumer preferences and build an omni-channel la layer to meet all of their financial needs through a unified digital-first platform. The ABCD D2C platform offers a comprehensive portfolio of 22 products and services. This includes core financing products from our lending, insurance, 
and investment businesses. The platform also features ABCD's own stack of products such as portfolio consolidator, spend analyzer, digital health assessment, amongst others, as also payment solutions to address the diverse needs of customers through a single platform. The ABCD D2C platform will further help ABC augment its digital footprint. It will acquire customers digitally and more importantly at scale, cross-sell and upsell in a frictionless manner and become a full-stack financial services provider. And the plan is to acquire 30 million new customers in the next three years. Backed by scalable infrastructure, a user-friendly and intuitive interface, and robust functionalities, the platform will deliver a seamless and differentiated experience across all touch points, which includes mobile apps, website branches, and virtual engagement channels. In line with our customer value proposition of making everything finance as simple as ABCD, the user, user experience has been meticulously designed to offer simplicity in product understanding and ensuring that navigation remains simple, seamless, interesting, and engaging. The ABCD platform, if I can continue, has been built by a very talented team that brings together deep and diverse experience from banks, fintechs, NBFCs, payments, and consulting firms. This team has been able to launch the ABCD platform successfully in a record time of 12 months only. It is a culmination. It is a culmination of 114,000 development hours, 36,000 design hours, 1,000 plus APIs, and 5,000 plus screens. In the arc of Aditya Birla Capital's progress, ABCD is a bold and transformative step, as you can imagine, towards capturing the collective confidence and ambition, not just of ABC, but of the whole group, to drive growth and take a leadership position in this space. I'm certain that a large ABG ecosystem of employees, customers, distributors, and channel partners, as well, will benefit from this platform, which will act as a growth catalyst across our businesses. Let me share some numbers to give you context of the scale of the ecosystem at, that the digital platform of ABC will tap into. Our cement flagship Ultratech has a dealer and retailer ecosystem of close to 150,000. Our recently launched paints business will have a channel partner ecosystem of 50,000 plus. In a fashion and retail business, we work with 1,500 plus franchisee partners and 1,000 plus sourcing vendors across the value chain. The other manufacturing businesses will have a partner vendor ecosystem of more than 50,000. And therefore, the 250,000 plus strong MSME partner ecosystem of the Aditya Birla Group is a source of huge competitive advantage for ABCD. In addition to this, we have access to a wide consumer ecosystem of over 250 million spread across telecom, fashion retail, and real estate alone. To conclude, Aditya Birla Capital is well poised for a phase of transformative growth. Our ambition is to become one of the top three players in each of the core businesses of ABC. I believe that this performance will mirror the explosive growth potential expected in the financial services sector in India over the next few years. Going forward, the sector, as some of you might know, is expected to outpace GDP growth by two times in the next five years. And the three leading components of our financial services model, credit, investments, and insurance, are expected to grow at a CAGR of anywhere from 19 to 21% over the next three to five years. All right, telling data coming in from Kumar Mangla Birla on a whole host of their businesses, but uh, speaking more so on Aditya Birla Capital, speaking about the distribution reach of their consumer businesses and laying out the vision to be between the top three players among all the key businesses that the company 
has been foraying into. We'll uh, get some more details as and when we get them. We'll dive back into the press conference as and when he is ready to answer some questions as well. With that, we'll take a short break, come back, continue our focus on the markets and a lot of individual stocks which are buzzing down. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, flattened out for the markets. The mid-cap index is now just about higher by around 40-odd points. Remember, when we started this show, the mid-cap index was up around three-tenths of a percent. We've seen a worsening in the advanced decline ratio, which has come through as well. So around 2,300 stocks advancing to around 1,461 stocks declining. So as uh, maybe the advanced decline ratio should come up for you. As you can see, there's a little bit of a narrowing which has taken place. Well, center stage in terms of a lot of the uncertainty that we're seeing in the markets in the past couple of days is due to the geopolitical tensions which continue to weigh on the markets globally with the rise of a possibility of an Iran-Israel conflict. In other developments, um, the US and UK have cracked down on Russian metals. Also, US Treasury yields have been surging to discuss the impact of all of these developments on India, as well as um, our macros, we have with us Madan Sabnis, who is the chief economist at Bank of Baroda, joining in. Uh, Madan, hi, thank you for joining in. Well, just wanted to start by asking you about um, what you're penciling in when it comes to Brent crude, uh, considering the variables that we're dealing with now. Are you expecting maybe $100 on it? Well, at this particular point of time, I don't think we're looking at a number of $100. I think we'll be in this range of around $90 per barrel. And we'll have to see as to whether this particular tension escalates further or not. Now, what, in my view, I think the way in which uh, things are developing, it does look like that uh, it would be a kind of a status quo-like situation. But in politics, one cannot really tell. So, and I think that if the worst case scenario, of course, is that if there is some kind of an escalation, there would be a case of global crude oil price going up to 100. But I would say the probability is probably much lower, maybe 20% uh, pro probability, 80% probably will remain in the current range. And from the Indian perspective, the fact that uh, we are not really importing much from uh, Iran, in fact, we're getting around one third of our uh, oil is coming from Russia, which is coming at a discounted price. I think at the present moment, I don't think there is any necessity for any kind of pan panic reaction on our side. All right. Uh... Madan, I just wanted your thoughts on the way uh, growth is likely to be in India as well. Inflation is a little sticky. From the consumption standpoint, a lot of people are, you know, worried about the lower end of the consumption spectrum, even as premium is doing very well. Now we have the elections. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, how is growth likely to pan out for India? And in that, what the distribution of this growth is likely to be? No, in fact... Uh... Yeah, given the fact that both SkyMet as well as IMD has spoken of a normal monsoon, I think that's quite significant. Though I would add the caveat out here that a normal monsoon does not indicate that everything is going to be good across all crops and regions. But assuming a, a normal monsoon and a normal Kharif crop, I think the missing factor which has been there in the India growth story in the last couple of years has been rural demand. So I think, as you have pointed out, I think the lower end uh, demand is something which hasn't really resurfaced since the pandemic. And if you're assuming that uh, things turn out to be different for agriculture this time and rural economy tends to be better than what it was in the last couple of years, I think that we could expect some kind of a recovery taking place in terms of uh, consumption in a more broad-based manner. This itself could also mean that uh, investment from the private sector, which has been lagging in the last couple of years, is something which could also tend to pick up. And therefore, we are quite optimistic about uh, GDP growth. In fact, in Bank of Baroda, we have an estimate of 7.8%, assuming all these good things happen, good monsoon, re uh, revival in consumption, revival in private sector investment. But at any rate, I don't think the, the growth rate will go below 7.5% for 24 25 Okay, so 7.8% and you don't expect the GDP to probably fall below 7.5% for FI25. Um, what about inflation? What are you targeting on inflation? Are you changing your model around now based on the variables, based on the fact that metal prices have inched higher? 
Yeah, see, actually, when you're talking of uh, inflation, I think we need to distinguish between WPI and uh, CPI. And if we're looking at CPI inflation, we are looking at a range of 45 to 5% for the year. And in terms of the developments which are taking place, even in terms of crude oil, like what we started off discussing, saying that if crude goes to 100, one can't rule it out, I think the impact is going to be more on the WPI than the CPI, because it looks like that the CPI is not going to be impacted much in terms of crude oil price going up, unless we go to the, the levels of 100 2130, which we don't expect at this point of time. So I think the CPL uh, inflation will be in the region of 4.5 to 5%. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of global prices moving upwards is going to be felt more in terms of WPI. And this is where we could be expecting WPI to be above 3% in 24 25 based on uh, these assumptions. Okay, all right. Um, that's uh, so more of an impact on WPI in case there is a rise in crude prices. I uh, just wanted your thoughts in terms of what one should consider going forward when it comes to the RBI's decision on rates. Because in the previous policy, uh, you know, the governor clearly indicated that they're not really completely linked to what the US Fed is doing. And now it seems as though the Fed is probably going to cut rates even later. And it might just be a very fluid situation based on the current scenario of geopolitics. Uh, based on that, one, do you have... How much do you expect from the Fed going forward now? And uh, how much are you expecting from the RBI? And how linked is the RBI's decision to the Fed? Okay, first, if you look at the Federal Reserve, uh, in my view, I think the, the rate cuts are going to take place much later. So what we were expecting probably sometime in June could get deferred by a couple of months because the Fed will definitely be uh, looking at what's going to happen in this Israel-Iran conflict as to whether it gets resolved soon or not. Because that's why we have seen even the U.S. Treasury's uh, yields going up in the market, something which has also affected the Indian market. Now, as far as India is concerned, I think the RBI has made a statement very clear, I think, in a number of policies that while it definitely looks at what the Federal Reserve is doing, but the mandate of the MPC is to target uh, the CPI inflation number. Now, if you just go by the forecast which the RBI has put out for inflation for the four quarters, it looks like that in the first quarter, we are still going to be closer towards the 5% number. It's going to be in the second quarter. So we're talking of the period of July, August, September, where inflation would come below the 4% mark. And then we're talking again of the number going up to 4.5, 4.6%. So in this kind of a cyclical kind of forecast which the RBI has made, I think if at all there's going to be a rate cut, I think the earliest is going to be probably in August, if not the, the policy after that in um, October. And we should not be expecting any kind of a deep rate cut, not more than 25 to 50 basis points is what I would tend to think. And even here, we should remember that traditionally, India has had a repo rate in the region of around 6 to 6.5%. And given the fact that growth is very much on the right path, we're talking of maybe 7.8, 7.5, RPI is talking of 7%. I don't think there's any concern saying that there could be any kind of compromise on growth. Because one of the MPC members did talk about growth being compromised at this stage. So I think that is definitely not on the cards the way I look at it. Right. So the RBI could be targeting inflation uh, more, uh, with more certainty this year. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Madan. Always a pleasure speaking with you, uh, putting the sense... Uh, of all the macros right now for all of us in the next one year, growth you don't believe for India will fall below 7.5% as well, with rent staying steady around $90 per barrel. Let's take a short break. On the other side, we'll get micro. We'll talk about the stocks itself. Uh, the mid-cap index has now moved into the red. The Nifty 2 has broken that 50-day moving average. Sachid Anand Uttekar will join in with some trading strategies. So how's keeping out of the markets? The Nifty is now down about 126 points from the highs of the day. It's seen some bit of supply. And as we speak, at, as uh, the day you know, progresses towards the second half, we're seeing the rise of India VIX. So India VIX has now moved to the high point of trade with a gain of almost a percent and a half. But from the lows, the volatility index has increased as well. What will keep us in good stead, though, is the fact that uh, the broader markets continue to do well. Despite uh, the mid-cap index falling into the red at uh, an index level, the broader markets the advanced decline ratio is still in favor of the advancers, and that's good news. Secondly, the Nifty is hovering around important technical levels. So we have, you know, uh, the 50-day moving average of the Nifty, which is 20 to 154. The Nifty is just about there, despite the sell-off that we've seen. And the Nifty Bank is at 47,432, 
which is again very close to its 20 day moving average. So both those levels come up for you on the screen for the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank. The Nifty has the 50 day moving average as an important support for the Nifty Bank. It is the 20 day moving average which is an important support as well. The second half of trade will have the weekly options expiry of the Nifty Bank and the Fin Nifty play out today. For the Nifty Bank is the 47,400 put and the 47,500 call which are most active telling you that the option writers are positioned for 47,360 to 47,550. The Nifty, is, Nifty Bank is absolutely in the middle of that range right now. For the Fin Nifty it's the 21,000 put and the 21,100 call again which is most active. The Nifty Financial Services is at 21,060 itself. Stocks to watch for the second half of trade. It's a tug of war between ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank. HDFC Bank has moved to the high point of trade, whereas ICICI Bank is closer towards the lower end of today's trading session. The stocks that I'm watching out for in terms of FNO ban and entry, Exide is one of them, which is flying away in today's trading session. Had entered FNO ban yesterday, likely to exit FNO ban today. The other one is Idea, which has exited FNO ban this morning, but may re-enter FNO ban given the open interest activity that we're seeing on this counter. Okay, all right, Manglam, thanks very much. For, for that, uh, Sachitanan Uttekar of Trade Bulls now joins in to discuss uh, what he's tracking on the market. Sachitanan, hi, welcome to the show. Well, it's turning out to be a little bit of a topsy-turvy session for us uh, today. Well, the mid-caps have also given up their gains. And as we speak, the Nifty is down around 128-odd points. The Sensex is down almost 500-odd points. How would you approach today? Do you think that there's further downside that we could see, especially ahead of a holiday? Uh, good afternoon, Ekta. Good afternoon, Manangalam. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, we expect that uh, the market would remain in the bear grip uh, at least uh, for this particular week itself. Now, the, the, the week itself started, uh, uh, you know, with a gap down and uh, that particular gap down occurred at the critical uh, support juncture of around 22,500. So, on the weekly scale, a downward gap is not a good sign. Uh, plus, if you look at, uh, you know, the corresponding data in today's trading session as well, you know, the Nifty has been confidently trending below that uh, 22,340 kind of a mark where it's uh, 5 and 20 exponential moving averages are placed. So clearly, I think until unless we don't see the Nifty, you know, uh, scaling above that particular level of 22,340, uh, the major uh, trend uh, should be on the short side. So we are expecting that uh, eventually the Nifty may fall towards 22,000 followed by 21,800, where it's a 20-week exponential moving average support is placed. So right now, uh, the construction of data is indicating that any particular relief uh, on the higher side should be utilized to create some short positions. And especially if you look at uh, the Nifty Bank data, uh, at least for the day, uh, 47,720 looks like a very strong hurdle. And on the lower side, uh, we are anticipating a move towards 47,300. So I think uh, it's better to keep some uh, you know, short positions handy. And uh, uh, when it comes to Nifty, I think uh, the level at which it is oscillating right now, 22,140, that particular level may not uh, hold on. And we may see uh, end of the day, uh, Nifty, you know, uh, dragging further below that 22,100. All right. And individual stocks, what would you uh, look at right now? Mangalam, uh, uh, two stock ideas, both on the short side and uh, both are recommended to our clients. Uh, that will be our disclosure. The first one is SBI. Now, if you look at the uh, weekly structure, you know, it was uh, showing signs of uh, a negative divergence and uh, kind of a distribution. Uh, what happened uh, right now is that uh, there was a weekly support at around 750 and that particular weekly support has been breached. Plus, the put OI action was very confident at 750 mark. So, uh, uh, you know, both uh, technically and derivative uh, data wise, you know, this particular level has been breached. So probably we may see this uh, swing getting extended towards its 20 week exponential moving average support, which is placed somewhere close to around 710. So we are expecting that, uh, uh, you know, uh, SBI uh, can be traded on the short side, uh, keep a stop loss somewhere close to around 762. Uh, uh, the immediate trading target could be around 735, but eventually we see this particular move extending towards uh, you know, 710. The other stock uh, which has been in a bear grip uh, and has been declining gradually has been Bajaj Auto. On the daily scale, uh, we have seen a, a breakdown uh, fresh below that 9000 mark. And from there on, you know, uh, the uh, short positions have been uh, you know, building further. So we're expecting that uh, this particular move may extend towards 8600 immediately followed by 8440. So hence we are recommending building short positions here in Bajaj Auto with a stop loss at 9040. 
Okay. Okay, all right, Sachidan, and we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us and giving us all of your uh, strategies. Well, a couple of stocks which are under pressure is LTI, Mindtree, and that is because of the resignations which have taken place. But separately, even something like an emphasis ahead of its numbers on Thursday is under pressure. So that stock is down around 2.8%. We'll take a short break, uh, but we have an announcement to share with you all. We're launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance webinar. CNBC TV 18 Accelerate Personal Finance Handbook with Sonia Shinoy, where she will be joined by three well-known experts on Saturday, 11th May, 9 a.m. onwards. We'll be diving into everything you need to know to master your finances and learn how to grow your wealth, be it insurance, tax saving, managing your portfolio, retirement planning. There's lots to learn and lots to do. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s or even 40s, this live webinar is for you. We have limited seats, so don't miss this chance. Register now. Scan the QR code to register or log on to cnbctv18.com. We'll see you on the 11th of May. Welcome back. Well, we have been discussing the impact of geopolitical tensions on the global market. The Indian market is also impacted by these developments. We have the Nifty, which is under pressure, uh, slipping below 22,200. We have uh, Dheeraj Sachdev, who is the managing partner and CIO Roha Asset Managers, to discuss his outlook for the markets. Dheeraj, hi. Welcome to the show. Well, you know, before we start talking about the markets in, as a whole, wanted your thoughts in terms of uh, the IT space. We have Infosys, which is coming out with its numbers on Thursday. The stock is under pressure ahead of that. Uh, what is your expectation on Infosys and your view probably on a stock such as LTI Mindtree, which has been an underperformer and is seeing a spate of resignations? Well, hi, good afternoon, Nekka. So uh, if you go by the reported numbers of the largest IT company, TCS, that there has been a modest growth and so far. Our guidance is not that optimistic in the near term. So long term, we could expect the adoption of cloud-based applications to increase as more IT works shifts to cloud. Now, there are plenty of new technologies such as IoT or big data and AI that we are talking about. These can sustain healthy growth for IT services over long term. But we think that I, the sector will underperform in the near to medium term due to growth and demand uncertainty in the US market. So, so we can only go with very modest expectations across these top five, seven years that you're talking about. All right. Um, so, what would your positioning on these five, seven names that you're talking about? I mean, is there a trade here? The fact that the stocks have underperformed and, uh, you know, growth headwinds are coming about along with Gen AI and the fact that there is some valuation comfort after this discount or this underperformance that we've seen as well. How do you play this? We are not playing too aggressively on the sector per se. As I as pointed out, the larger ones offer a little margin of safety. Many of them, even in the mid cap category, are not too cheap in terms of relative valuations. And given the modest growth and uncertainty that we are talking about, we only uh, will remain underweight on as a strategy on the investment side. Okay, all right. Uh, well, let's now move to the markets. Um, you know, we have the mid caps which have been quite choppy now. How would you approach it in light of all of the geopolitical uncertainty? Do you think that you would probably shift your focus, shift your money towards the large caps and probably take some profits off the mid as well as the small caps? I think clearly currently Indian equity market is passing through global challenges of heightened geopolitical environment, red sea freight related cost issues for exporters, to firming up of US interest rates, bond yields and fewer rate cuts. Uh, including recent sporting commodity costs, paid oil or base metals. How, despite all these challenges, given the earnings support of India corporate sector and rising retail equity culture of global flows, it is a high probability even that market will sustain rally and the corrections are likely to be sharp but short-lived. So we'll not be uh, surprised, but these major reactions, high volatility, etc., will be the phase over the next few weeks. But the corrections will be short-lived. The continuity of reformist government is being anticipated by the markets and along with better earnings work will be the twin forces 
that will push markets to higher levels in time to come. Broadly, we remain positive given strong KPEGs or improving manufacturing cycle, including uh, reforms in the power and renewable sector. Now, on the small and mid-cap side, to be specific, uh, it is unwise to generalize all stocks to one basket, as the category is has a vast ocean of billions of stocks, spanning over a few hundred to thousand companies. So one needs to have bottom-up approach to stock picking, despite relative volatility or beta being higher than the large caps. Yes, valuations in many cases may, have, may be ahead of earnings or offer less margin of safety compared to 12 months back. But still, one may find opportunities in three out of 10 cases from the valuation perspective. So I don't see any reason where over a longer period of time, selling bottom of opportunities can still far greater relative returns than the large caps. So it's a myth that the large caps will continue to outperform um, you know, the mid and large, mid and small caps over a longer period of time. All right, and uh, what what sectors would you stay away from, and what particularly offers some upside from current levels? So we are avoiding companies that are largely dependent on exports. Uh, so we may be underweight on IT, as we talked about, due to project delays or lower than expected growth uh, and modest growth guidance. We're also watching metals for now, despite the rally that we saw, but we are not very convinced because the structural problems are still there on the real estate side in China. So despite some recent manufacturing activity showing momentum, we're not fully convinced uh, on the metals rally as such, and we are waiting to watch. We may go wrong here, but uh, we're not fully convinced on the rally as such. So these are a couple of large sectors we are avoiding for now. Okay, all right, Dheeraj. Um, we're going to let you go on that note. Uh, thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us and talking to us about the markets. Well, for the markets, uh, as we've been telling you, it's now become sluggish. So we have the Bank Nifty, which is down around 7 tenths of a percent. The mid caps have given up their gains and is now down around 63 odd points for the mid cap index. The small cap index, however, is still managing to hold its head above the water. So maybe that should come up for you. It's showing a gain of around 4 tenths of a percent. The BSC small cap index should be up on your screen as well. Well, we need to take a short break. But on the other side, Manisha Gupta will join in. She has with her Ajay Goel, the chairman of Wheat Products Promotion Society. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Uh, well, we've been pointing out that it is uh, sluggish for the markets, it's sluggish for IT stocks, but even um, a couple of these banks are taking it on the chin. So individually, we've been talking about the Bank Nifty as a headline index, but individually, Indusind Bank is down 2.5%, Bajaj FinServe is down around 2.3% at this point in time. State Bank of India is also showing a cut of around 1.3%. So all of these stocks under pressure. Holding its head above the water is HDFC Bank. So that stock is holding with a gain of around 3 tenths of a percent as we speak. But uh, Manisha is now with us. Um, she's taking us through the commodity segment. Manisha, over to you. Thank you so much for that, Ekta. But I'm talking about wheat prices right now because they have been on slight higher levels. And Abhimanyu was earlier talking to the food secretary, Sanjeev Chopra, and he did tell him that the procurement that the government is looking for in this year is expected to be on the higher side as compared to the previous year. Because remember, the wheat holdings with government, uh, the buffer stock, that is, at a multi-year lows. Joining us now is Ajay Goel. He's chairman at the Wheat Products Promotion Society. Uh, Ajay, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. What is your sense? Because we do know that there are various curbs and restrictions when it comes to essential commodities in India, now with the expectation that uh, government will be able to procure enough and more wheat, what is the private trade looking like and how are you looking at the government procurement numbers? Well, the government has set itself a, quite an ambitious target of 31 million tons. But uh, the problem is that all of the uh, mandis in the market, the government is not equipped to uh, you know, uh, purchase, especially in UP, it has been found in the past that, you know, although it sets the target, it doesn't uh, actually realize it. But good luck to the government and uh, estimators that it will be between about 25, 26 uh, million tons is what the government procurement is likely to cross. And the whole idea of the government last uh, year is to keep food inflation under control and they procure the maximum to participate to uh, sell out in the you know market intervention programs and uh, things like that, which keeps the markets in the leash. So the private trade is slowly withdrawing its participation in uh, stocking and uh, uh, when the uh, crop is coming in. At that time, there is very low activity uh, uh, from the private trade side. Mm. 
Uh, so, Ajay, what is private trade doing right now? I mean, we do understand that there are limits that you can hold on to, that there are mandatory uh, disclosures that the trade has to do in various commodities, not just wheat here. And with the government wanting to increase its buffer stock, how is private trade viewing this? So, officially, there is no uh, bar on private trade to participate currently. Uh, but it is expected that if the government is not able to procure uh, their targets, there will be lots of curbs on private trades and suddenly, you know, you will have stock limits and private trade will be told to liquidate their stocks. So that fear is there in the mind and unofficially, the government is spreading the word around that it wishes to first, uh, you know, complete its uh, procurement target and private trade should not actively uh, be in the marketplace. That's the uh, sort of... Uh, feeling everybody is getting, uh, feelers that's getting from uh, government. So uh, mm -hmm. private trade is just in the wait and watch situation currently. Uh, you know, Ajay, I remember a couple of years ago when the wheat prices were rising, a lot of people wanted to enter the trade. Would you say it's quite contrary to that right now? Yeah, absolutely. So nobody wants to be on the other side of the law, you know. And the law, the government is taking out notifications to control wheat markets and other commodity markets. Almost weekly, they are, uh, you know, coming up with new instructions. Right now, every trader or uh, miller who is purchasing wheat has to declare his weekly stock. So that is the only restriction uh, that is there so that the government is in a situation to monitor. But there is a scare scenario within the trade that, you know, uh, once uh, the government realizes that it's not getting most of the stock as desired, it may certainly put in the curbs. Mm. Uh, also, another important statement is that when you look at the last one year, we've seen the wheat MSP increase by 7%, but the wheat prices have only gone up by 5%. What does that really mean for the trade? I mean, it's, it clearly can't be profit-making. No, no, surely it's uh, government's uh, subsidies uh, that are at play all the time, continuously. The government is uh, against uh, any sort of food inflation in the country. So all, uh, all the wheat that is procured by the government, it uh, besides distribution, to the vulnerable and needy. It also has the market intervention program. Last year, they sold about 10 million tons of wheat in the OMSS scheme, which is quite a subsidized sale. And of course, the government is also coming out with its own ATA and rice and their own brand and uh, uh, distribution. These are the steps that the government is taking directly uh, uh, for consumer protection, but the industry and trade in between is you know caught uh, caught up because uh, the trade uh, will have its own costs and it's in no position to subsidize uh, its business so that's the sort of scenario currently prevailing all right okay all right mr goyal as well as manisha thanks very much for taking us through that conversation we need to take a short break more on the markets once we're back stay tuned Welcome back. Aisha Motors, top gainer on the Nifty at this point, up around 3-odd percent for that particular stock. It's done quite well. It's up around 8-odd percent on a month-to-date basis as well, so it's managed to buck the trend. Uh, ONGC2 is doing well today, so that stock is up around 2.5-odd percent. It's a crude play. And a couple of these defensives, such as Dr. Reddy, Sipla, managing to hold their head above the water. Even HUL, which is up around 0.4 percent at this point in time has underperformed uh, on a year-to-date basis, but is showing some amount of traction on the upside, so do watch out for that, and giving it companies DB's lab. So there's de clearly a, a move towards de defensive play with FMCG, as well as a couple of these pharma stocks seeing some amount of traction, and throw in a couple of these auto stocks, as well as these oil plays, such as BPCL and ONGC. So that's what's taking place in terms of the Nifty at this point in time. Mid-caps absolutely flat. Nifty still down around 140-odd points. It's a wrap on Halftime Report. Business Lunch up next.